Hi everybody. So for our second lab report, our short report, we're going to be focusing on the brass in the copper in brass experiment. And rather than take up our time with the lab, since the lab does take some time, but more importantly to make sure you had this as a resource when you sat down to do your writing, I wanted to record this as a video to make sure that you're doing what I want for the short report that includes your materials and methods and your results. So let's click into the rubric for this. Now I'll point out that in our module, you'll see a couple of writing guides talking about the methods, materials and methods. We also call that the experimental section. A section talking about results and how we demonstrate them. We have some more information on using Excel to make graphs, though I've already made a video for us about that previously. And then some ways of showing your sample calculations and some general stuff on formatting. Do make sure you take a look at all of that. Uh, so this will be a, a supplement to these pieces of information to make sure that you're writing what I want and how I'm going to evaluate it using this rubric. Now, if you click into here, along with the Dropbox, you should see the rubric. And clicking in here, you can see we have some links to those things I just mentioned. We have a file right here that when you open it, will also export uh, the rubric as a PDF file. So you can see exactly what we have in our rubric. And then in my view, at least, well, you won't have this part. This is from Turnitin. Uh, for me to see who submitted it and the power percent match and all that. But down below there is where I have my version of the rubric. Now I've also just tossed the rubric into another window. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just full screen this so you can see it there. And hopefully it doesn't pixelate too badly. Uh, and if it does, I'll come back over to the other window. But this will let you see exactly what I'm gonna be clicking on when I do the grading. So for your materials and methods section, again, also known as experimental. The whole point of this section is to communicate how you approached your work and did a high quality, well-controlled experiment that answers the question at hand. You've probably been taught in the past that your goal is to teach someone how to replicate your results. I don't like that approach. I don't like that description for it. Even though we do have it down here in the rubric a little bit, I think it's taking you in the wrong direction. So I really want to focus in more on, you are trying to convince the reader that you have the definitive answer. Remember how science actually works. We would go do research in our laboratory. We'd get our results, we'd work them all up, we'd know for sure what, well, at least what we think it, we know for sure, what the result is, right? And if we've done it right, and our analysis is right, there is no reason for anyone to do that exact experiment ever again. We just generated the definitive answer. If somebody measures the speed of light and they tell me all the details of how they measured it and I look at that and say, wow, that looks like an excellently done piece of work. I don't see any flaws. I'm not gonna just measure the speed of light as a, yep, I did it too, procedure. Th that's just senseless, we, we don't do that. Um, the only time you do something again is if the materials have gotten better, maybe we have better standards. If the instrumentation has gotten better, maybe we can measure something to nanoseconds instead of milliseconds. You know, if, if we have some major change to the field, somebody might revisit the topic and improve upon it. Or somebody might use your methodology to do a different kind of work that's related but distinct. So we're not gonna tell them exactly how we did it, not because we're trying to make them start from scratch. It's just not the point. We already have procedures for that. In fact, one of the things I see people do really wrong writing this section is they take the lab manual, they copy paste it into a Word document, and they go through and change everything from a bullet point numbered list into a paragraph form, and then they change it all to be past tense and passive voice. So instead of collect 10 milliliters of the solution, They'll just mad libs it and say, 10 milliliters of this solution were collected. That's not the point of this exercise. That's just transcribing. We're trying to get you to be able to understand how we actually do scientific writing. So for this per part, what we really want you to do, focus on telling somebody what mattered in your experiment and how you controlled it. Which means that we're gonna bring up hardware that actually tell someone something about the quality of the measurement. We don't talk about the beakers, why? Because the beakers are the juice glasses of science. They hold your liquid 
but they're terrible for doing a measurement. They're just there to hold something. That's all a beaker is for, right? I've said that in class a few times. Now, when we want a good measurement, we'll use a burette or a pipette or a volumetric flask. Mention those things in your procedure because you're communicating that the volume is well controlled and that your number has the sig figs that you claim. So that's why we're gonna mention those pieces of hardware. We also aren't gonna tell somebody every button that we push on the hardware because the hardware you use, uh, the model spectrometer you use, the buttons are all gonna be labeled differently. Uh, and again, people look at a procedure to see how to handle that, or they'd look in the owner's manual to see how to handle that. We're gonna tell them what we did overall so they know the quality of the measurement. That's our focus in the experimental section. So let's take a look at what you'd be graded on here. So the first category for mats and methods is your procedure and techniques. So tell it in enough detail that people know what you did. Let's just change the wording from what it says here. They don't have the same instrument. You don't have to talk about how to run the program, how to power it on, all of that. You don't have to say, first, all of the materials were collected yeah we know unless you were psychic and have magic powers it can make the solutions appear at will and if you can come work in my research group we'll get a lot done really fast but i'm guessing most people can't everybody knows that you collected the materials that you were going to use beforehand skip that just skip that okay uh so then let's see so what do we actually talk about here we're going to give enough detail for people to understand how we approached the problem, how we did our measurement, and how we kept it really well controlled. So for one of our experiments, uh, let's say the chromatography and color experiment. Some of the things you did as a control is we made sure we've, uh, we, knew, uh, not neutralized, but we equilibrated the set pack by passing through uh, various solutions of increasing polarity, uh, make sure it was clean. Then we loaded our dye onto the set pack with a uh, low po lower polarity solvent so that all of our dye molecules would stick to the stationary phase. We then varied the polarity of the solution so we would separately elute each of the colors. Each of the two colored dyes were collected separately they were analyzed spectroscopically on a UV vis spectrometer. We diluted them all to have identical uh, total volumes so that their concentrations would match what was in the original grape Kool Aid sample, which was also diluted similarly. Obviously, I'm not being perfectly organized in the way I'm saying this since I'm kind of writing out loud, right? But you're getting a feel for the sort of things, I hope, that we would have brought up as controls in the uh, chromatography and color lab. It was all about separating the dyes, getting to be equally diluted, checking the spectra of all of these things, comparing them and being able to see what sort of purity we had in each one of them. And for that, we did calculations like um, our percent recovery. So that's the sort of thing we would have done in the materials and methods section for that experiment. So think about what we would actually include for this experiment. And I'll let you think about that. Uh, I'll have conversations with you if you want, but uh, I'll leave that outside of the video. Okay, so we're gonna describe what we did and how it led to a controlled experiment. You can see when I kind of skipped a second ago, I came out of full screen here. Uh, I'm just gonna leave it out of full screen for our purposes now. All right, so... Sorry, that's nonstop. And I forgot how to turn off the ringer, so I'll deal with it later. Okay, anyway, next part of the materials and methods. So describe it. Okay, we said this part here. Next up, we get to our instrumentation, equipment, and chemicals. We're gonna specify the things that actually contribute to the quality of our experiment. So again, we're not gonna bring up the beakers. We'll bring up the spectrometer. I'm not terribly concerned with whether you bring up the model of the spectrometer or not. We probably should in professional writing for our purposes, I'll live with it if you accidentally say that it's the spec 20, even though we're not using spec 20s anymore. You know, that's what it says in the manual. You may not have jotted the new one down in your notebook. You should, but you know, we're working toward that. This is Gen Chem 1. So we're gonna write down the sort of things that we did. Now, 
we did use serological pipettes, so you'd bring up something like that because it tells us the quality of the value. Remember, we have whole number of milliliters, explicitly marked our tenths of a milliliter. We estimate the hundredths of a milliliter. So for our sig figs, all of these should be giving us two decimal places. And I'm sure that you all recorded two decimal places in your lab notebook, because that's something we've been bringing up, right? So you'll show that when you're talking about it later on in your results. Here, we're gonna set that up by talking about the fact we used it because that will contribute to the quality of the experiment later on. If you did dilutions where you got multiple things diluted at the same volume, you'll specify that too. Or if you were doing a reaction and you know you might have had evaporation in that reaction, maybe you diluted it to 100 milliliters in a violet eumetric flask to ensure that the sample was of a known final volume before you used Beer's Law. Not to give you a hint on this lab, so that's the sort of thing you're going to want to bring up in your instrumentation uh, portion of this. Now, as always, formatting and grammar matter, so make sure you're actually spell checking it, writing complete sentences, using good grammar. Generally speaking, this should be in the past tense and passive voice. You're not going to be excoriated in professional writing if you didn't, because it's not really a rule that you do it this way, but everyone does. And the reason everyone does is we're actually communicating what we did in the lab. And because it flows well, we usually use it in the past tense and passive voice. Also because we're trying not to just say, I did this and I did that. It starts sounding like we're just bragging about it. And we'll do that after we're done publishing the paper. We'll do that when we give our, our talk on it, right? In the paper, we're telling the details of what was done. We're not focusing on ourselves, we're work, focusing on the work. And that's really why we generally stay past tense and passive voice. If you slip into a present tense verb, I'm not going to dock you much. But if the whole thing is being present tense, then I'm going to, you know, have something to say about it. So do stay past tense, do stay passive voice. Uh, make sure you grammar check it, use complete sentences, use your correct punctuation, you know, all the stuff you should be doing in any paper. If you need help on that, um, if English isn't your first language for your writing, um, either check with your lab partner to see if they can give you some feedback about it, or even better, honestly, go to the FGC Writing Center and ask them for feedback on your draft. It's much better if you do one of these things because you're going to get some practice and polish on it. Now, I did bring up a lab partner there. I do want to remind you, all of us has the rule, two keyboards, two screens, no direct transfer. So they should not be sending you your, their copy for you to change. You're not going to use any of their language. You're not going to mad libs it. You're not going to just right click and change some phrases. You need to write your own from scratch. You can talk to each other, but do it on two separate monitors with two separate keyboards and not the same file. Uh, I shouldn't see any of the metadata in common between these two files. Uh, and that's something I do check for when I start to see too many similarities. So make sure you're doing the work separately and on your own. Now going on from there, this shouldn't be bullet points. It shouldn't be a numbered list like it is in the lab manual because that's a procedure. This is a paragraph format description of what we did and why it contributes to a well-controlled, well-designed experiment that answers the question at hand. You might notice that I've used that phrase a few times in a row now. There's a reason for that. So make sure that's where your focus is as you're doing your writing. Now coming on from there, we're going to get into our results. From this experiment, we have two different types of graphs that we're going to show. And we've done both these types before. We're going to show a UV vis spectrum of both our pure copper solution, our standard, and of our dissolved brass screw. Now, if the dissolved brass screw's concentration and absorbance is wildly different from your starting concentration for the copper nitrated uh, portion, I get it if you want to show those as two separate graphs. But if they're fairly comparable in their sizes, it's better to just do one graph so you can actually compare all the peaks of one to the other. Remember that on your x-axis for a spectrum, you've got your wavelength. <clears throat> and remember that when we're showing the behavior of something that doesn't have a specific relationship behind the scenes, like a numeric relationship. When we're showing something like a spectrum, in other words, where it has peaks. And what we're wanting people to spot is, 
here is how, where it absorbs light. That means we're not going to actually show sections we didn't measure. So don't start your axis down at zero wavelength, uh, zero nanometers for your wavelength axis. Start at 380 or whatever wavelength you started at. Go up to the maximum. You know, show it like that. Now on your y axis, actually let me back up. On your x axis is what you had direct control over. That was wavelength. You type that number into the spectrometer. The thing you got as results goes on the y axis. So on the y axis, you put the absorbance because that's what you actually measure, right? So for your spectrum, it'll be wavelength on x and absorption on y. Then you have a separate one. You also still need to show your Beer's Law line, which is a kind of calibration curve. In those, we had control over the concentrations and we deliberately made a continuous range starting from zero molar up to 0.1 molar because we know that was the maximum concentration for our standard, right? So you're going to graph that line with concentration on X and absorbance on Y. That also means that in your Beer's Law, Y is absorbance. X is wavelength. I'm sorry, is concentration. I, just, I don't know why I slipped on that. It's concentration. That means slope is going to be the other parts of Beer's Law. Slope is going to be your uh, molar absorptivity and your path length. So that's where you're going to be able to get that from. And you may still have an intercept that the straight line model shows you, meaning that it wasn't a perfect zero calibration uh, for zero concentration. That's fine, you're still gonna have that in your equation. So we're gonna use that straight line equation. But remember, when we're setting one of those up, the calibration curve, how do you do it? Well, for your series, you wanna show the dots for each measurement, but you don't want the connect the dots model. You just want the dots. Then you're going to insert your line of best fit, your calibration curve, uh, or whatever you want to call it there. And then you can also show your equation for that line. Excel will set it up for you. You'll still need to show a sample calculation for that, and that shows up in this next little piece of it. For data tables, it would be helpful to show the data table for how you got your concentrations, so all the volumes that you used for the four samples, your concentrations, and that kind of thing. I do not find it helpful for you to put in the table that shows your spectrum. So all the wavelengths and the absorbances, it's just going to take a ton of space and it's better represented by the graph anyway. The reason I say the Beer's Law part, it's good to have the table, we can actually use those numbers to do calculations, right? So that's kind of the distinction we're making between those pieces. Make sure you're showing appropriate sig figs. Remember. I'm obsessive about sig figs. That's how we work as an analyst uh, in analytical chemistry. So that's what's going to be showing up is your results there, coming down a little more from your graphs. What else am I looking for? Making sure that you have your axes done right, the, all the points are showing up. Did you use the right kind? In other words, a scatter plot? Did you use connections as appropriate for your spectrum? It's appropriate to use connect the dot lines. In fact, curved lines are even okay for that too, right? but we don't want to connect the dots for our calibration curve. Uh, do we have all that there? Is there a title? Are things properly labeled? Do you have your units on your axes? Best line of best fit showing? All that good stuff. That's where I'm going to be putting points in for that. <clears throat> now coming down to the last page of this, we need to have a spot where there's sample calculations. I don't feel the need to make you learn how to use equation editor in Word. It makes your equations look pretty, but it's also a huge use of time. I am okay with it if in a very legible form, you show your sample calculations on paper and somehow digitize that. The best bet is a scanner. You know, stop by a computer lab and put it through the scanner. Uh, or at home, a, a flatbed scanner or something like that's great too. If not, make sure you have even lighting on the paper and you could use some sort of a camera phone app um, and make sure that you actually turn it into the rectangular form that it should be instead of how it's keystoned. You know, like with the pictures, if you do that, a lot of time it'll let you then straighten it so that it actually shows correctly. 
I'm okay with you digitizing it that way and embedding the image into your Word file where you wrote up your whole report. That I'm okay with. Um, so that's a good way to show your sample calculations. Um, show all of your important calculations uh, for one trial. You don't have to show all three or whatever, but you gotta show at least one. Um, then you get into your error analysis. Talk about your R squared. Is it good? Is it really close to the number one? That means about 100% of the, of the behavior between your X and your Y axis can be attributed to that theoretical model, Beer's Law. If not, that means there's extra behavior happening. Either there's random error from your experiment or you didn't do a, a very precise job of making your solutions. That's the most likely one for us probably. Uh, but you can talk about that. If there's any averages that you're doing and standard deviations, you could show that. I can't think of any from this experiment on the moment, but you know there might be. Any of these sort of things that you can show how well controlled your experiment was from the data side, you're gonna show them here in your error analysis. Uh, also, your discussion questions might give you some hints about what you want to include in that section. Then I have a whole section here for the overall formatting. You know, is it well laid out? Can I read it? Do you use re reasonable headlines? I'm not headlines, sorry, um, uh, section headings. Um, was your grammar appropriate? Um, that sort of thing. Typos, spell check things, all that. That goes into this category here for the points. You see that's the end of the rubric here. So you'll have access to this as you're doing your writing. You'll also have access to this little uh, blurb. So if you're forgetting what sort of things I wanted to check on, you can check this video and it'll give you some extra feedback about it. With that, I hope this was helpful for everyone and uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions.